Looking at me here on the top bed, it looks ridiculous. Me preaching with my hat on. Does it look ridiculous? Yeah. No, so why is everybody just happy? Would you be happy if I turned up every Sunday and just started preaching with a big old hat in my head? It's not funny. Is it disrespectful? Yes. Well, it isn't. Where do we get that from? See, we know that it's disrespectful for a man to wear a hat when we're praying or when we're coming into a place of worship. But when the reason it is, it's all biblical. It comes from the Bible and it's disrespectful towards the Lord. I'm going to take it off now, but it was just to drive home a point. And we're going to read it in 1 Corinthians 11. We, we take the table from this passage of Scripture, but just before it, verse 1. I'll give you a second to find it. 1 Corinthians. Anybody need a Bible? Raise your hands. The boys will come around with a Bible. Sandy, you want to pass the Bible's round? A few hands up. You know, as the brothers are passing the Bible's round, let's pray and ask the Lord, because we're really going to need His help this morning. I'm going to need His help, and you're also going to need His help. Because what we're preaching this morning goes against our culture, it goes against our time, it goes against basically every fiber in your body. <laughs> so you need help, and I need help as well. So let's pray that the Lord will just move and have His way. Thank you. Dear Lord, I just ask my Jesus. Lord, that you move by the power of your Spirit this morning, Lord. Lord, that when we speak from your word, my God, we don't speak on our own behalf. But Lord, we are your messengers, Lord. Lord, I ask my Jesus, Lord, that you give us understanding today, Lord. Lord, that our hearts will be ready to receive and our minds will be ready to receive, Lord. Lord, that our hearts will be ready to be obedient to you, Lord. Lord, I ask you to pray in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus. And all God's children says, Amen. So 1 Corinthians 11, everybody there? Amen. Right, say this. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remain, you remember in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is even as if she should be shaven. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shaven. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the image and glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman was created for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. I'm going to stop there. Now instantly you're thinking, what on earth is this speaking about? Some of the women in here, some of the men are going to be like, yes, preach it, brother. <laughs> but some of the women are going to be like, oh, hold on a minute, I don't like this. I'm uncomfortable with this. What does this mean? And listen, that's just our culture. Because right now, in our culture, there's feminism, it's, it's on the rise, it's everywhere you look. And, you know, feminine, feminism is rife among, you know, everybody, our culture, in general, broad culture. It's in the movies, it's in TikTok, Facebook, everywhere you look, it's telling you that, you know, you're not under no man, that you can do whatever you want to do, be whoever you want to be, and all this stuff, right? It's feminism. And you know when you look at it as well, the, the women, uh, you know, you see these business women, right? High up, high end business women. The majority of them, it's, all got, like, it, it's almost like a, a man's haircut. They want to be, they're starting to wear suits now. It, it's, it, it's style and fashion for a woman to try and look like a man. That's where we're going. And even when you look at, even take on a broader spectrum now, with all the, I know that sometimes we go into genderism and all these things, but we have to preach against the culture, I'm sorry. It's in the word of God, I don't make no apologies for God's word. But you know, there's men trying to be women and now you can't even say what they are. You know when you say, yes, uh, yes, woman, oh, did you just assume my gender? You know, you can't assume anybody's gender now. You know, if they're called a dolphin or a dog or a cat or a woman or a man, you're not allowed to. It's crazy. But it's the way it's, the culture is going. And I tell you what the, the broader problem is. It's not we head scams. It's not we looking like men or women. The broader problem is it's authority. We have a problem with authority. But you know, God is a God of authority, believe it or not. He does it and he teaches it. And we're going to see that from Scripture. 
So the Bible says that a man should not pray a prophesy with his head covered. Because it's simply the most simple explanation is that he's in the image of God. You are basically an ambassador of Christ, of God. And when you, you, you know, you're a man, you're, you're in the likeness of God, so you shouldn't cover your head because that, that means that you're under authority of something else. When you're under authority of God. But the woman, she comes from the man. And, you know, this is even a, a, a wassail, you're not going to like this, but the woman was made for the man. And there'll be a few injections about that one, like, hold on a minute. But that's the way the Bible reads it out, and that's the way that God made you. To be a man's helper, to be man's aid. And instantly you will have a problem with that. Some of you may have a problem with that. Some of you may say, no, that's wrong. I don't care what the Bible says. Well, remember last time we preached about building on the foundation. And remember that our, our ideas are here, and God's ideas are here. Well, it's time to put it into practice, because this is going to be hard. But we have to. Regardless of what you think or what you've been taught, even traveling women, that are all women, just, it's not even a, a, a traveling tipsy thing. But you know, even when you look at daughters these days, they go back to the mother and father. I wouldn't let him speak to you like that. You know, blah, blah, blah. But really, the Bible teaches the older women, she teaches the younger women to love the husbands, to be respectful, to look after the home, to look after the children. But now, because we're living in such a... a, 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 a a, a, a society that hates authority. It's not like, don't let him speak to you like that. Don't let us do And all the roles are just being reversed. But it's not what God intended it to be. Can we say amen? Yeah. <laughs> Some of the brothers, amen. <laughs> Sisters, <laughs> no. <laughs> but the point is, headship authority. That's what it comes down to. The head of every woman is the man. The head of all the children is the mother. But the head of every man is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. Believe it or not, Jesus Christ is God. But yet he comes under the authority of God the Father. He's, you know, it's, it's, it's set out by God and it's even exampled by God. It's not that he asks you to do something that he himself doesn't do. He has come under authority. He has come under the headship of God. And you know the, what, the, the head is like the, the, sort of the head of a river where it comes from. You know, women was taken out of the rib of a man that tells us that in Genesis. Women is from men and they are to help men. So that's what we're kind of going to go over, right? And you know, I just want to, before we get into the study as well, I want to say that, you know, just because you wear a headscarf doesn't mean that you're not obedient to your husband. There's plenty of women that wear headscarves. But don't listen to the husband at all. There's plenty of women that will have the sign of obedience, but yet they'll be the most disobedient women you've ever seen in your life. So that means nothing. It's sort of like carrying a Bible to touch, right? I can carry a big Bible and I can have it under my arm and I can look the part. But am I doing what it tells me to do? It's the same with head scouts. It's, it's a, an outward sign of an inward conversion. Same as baptism almost. It's, like a, it's an outward expression of what's happening on the inside. You're saying that I'm coming, when you wear that headscarf, I'll tell you what you're saying. I'm coming under authority of my husband. If you're single, you say, well, I don't have to wear a headscarf, I don't have a husband. No, you're coming under the authority of your father. If, you don't, if you're single and you don't have a father, then you can come under the authority of the pastor of the church. And if there's no pastor and nothing, and you, there's no excuse because the Bible even says because of the angels. You know there is angels present in this meeting. And because of them, and out of respect, we, the women wear headscarves. Why? Because it's a sign of authority. Come on under authority. Can you say amen? Don't worry, we're going to get round to it. So God set the order. Number one. I've got three reasons for male headship. Why the man is head of the home. Right? Number one is that God has established an order of authority. So somebody read me Ephesians 5, 23. It's going to be a bit like a Bible study this morning, but it's just the way we've been led. Ephesians 5, 23. Somebody read it nice and loud. Of the wife, as Christ also has the head of the church. 
That'll do to me. So God will just simply set it up, right? The order is God, Christ, man, woman, children. It's not like an umbrella. You see that picture of the umbrella? You know, the man is the head of the home. Christ is the head of the man. God is the head of Christ. And, and, and that's the way that God set it out in an orderly fashion. So I'm going to read 1 Timothy 2.12. A few scriptures to back it up just in case you're arguing with me. Don't argue with me. Argue with the Bible. <laughs> argue with God. 1 Timothy 2.12. So read it. If we endure, we shall also be with him. If we deny him, we also will deny him. Is that 1 Timothy 2.12? 1 Timothy 2.12. So Paul said, I do not uh, permit a woman to teach or have authority above a man. She should not assert authority above a man. It's the way that God has set it up. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, the scripture that we're in, I'll read it, says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of... Christ is God. So that's the way that God set it up. Right? Number two. Reasons for male headship. It is the order of creation. So, you know, I'm going to read Genesis 2 verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. This is the way it happens. Whether we like it or not. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help to help him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. But see, out of man God created woman. Uh, we're going to read Genesis 2, 22, down a bit. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So creation tells you that when you're created from something, that you know that there's a certain level of authority. We are created by God, so guess who's got authority over me and you? That's why an atheist hates the existence of God. Because they know if God is a creator God, then guess what? He's got authority over us and they cannot stand it. So they say there is no God. With an explosion created everything. Nothing exploded and here we are today. I'm going to believe that. Why? Because the alternative is I have to come under authority. And I ain't doing it. And it's the same way, you know, that the woman's came from the man. So it's, it's sort of like the, there's, there's a, a level of authority that has to be there. It's the way that God set it up. Are we getting uncomfortable yet? <laughs> Have we got all the stones ready and just chuck them at me after the meeting? Number three. Because angels are watching. Now, you know, I looked into this and I thought, wow, what a point. Somebody read Ephesians chapter 3, 10 to 11. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 to 11. Anybody got it? So that, so that. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the church, to the rulers and the authorities in heaven, heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose for the carrying out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Think, read that again, Jimmy. Just listen to this. Read it again. So that the manifold wisdom of God. God might be made known to who? Through the church, to the rulers and authorities, princes and heavenly places. So, who, who is, is the wisdom being demonstrated through? The church. Who to? Who are we teaching? The principalities, the angels. They learn from us. God has made manifest so that they can learn from us. You know, the angels are always watching and learning and observing. Somebody read. 1 Corinthians, I'm fine, I'll get it. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. Listen to this one. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed today, for we have made a spectacle unto the world. And to who? The angels. 
and to men. Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9. They are a spectacle unto men and angels. They are what to? 1 Peter 1 verse 2. I'll get this one. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 says this. And I know there's a lot of scriptures, but I have to back everything I'm saying up. Or else you wouldn't, you wouldn't like it, I wouldn't like it. 1 Peter 1 verse 12, sorry, says this. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that they have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. You know, angels are always looking and desiring to look into the things of even the gospel, the things that's been taught. In church, they are present. And it seems to be from this scripture, now when you read that in context, back to 1 Corinthians 11, and, and, and Paul said, you, we call our heads women as respect for the angels. You know, they're watching, and it's a sign of respect. And you've got to remember this, right? One third of heaven was cast out. Why? What for? Because they didn't like authority. And these angels are watching and they're present. How we wash, how we come into the presence of God. And yet sometimes we come into the presence of God, our heads not covered, we're not doing it the right way, we're not coming under authority. It's not good. And it's not right. And it's not respectful. Can we say amen? So what's man's plan? Well the Bible says the head of every man is Christ. So brothers, just in case you think you're getting away light, you ain't getting away light. It's a team, it's a unit. We work together, right? The head of every man is Christ. So just as the head of every woman is the man, the head of every man should be Christ. And you know, that's a challenging point for us because is Christ the head of your home? Is Christ leading you and guiding you as you lead and guide your wife? Are you following the instructions of God? You know, because if we really looked in, no, we probably were falling short. So it's a challenge for us. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Laid down his life. You know, we have a challenge that we have to look after our wife, take care of her needs. But not only that, we have to love her so much that the same love that Christ loved the church and laid his life down for it. That's the way you are to love your wife. Uh, the end you are getting away easy. No, no. You see, there's a challenge. And, you know, partly sometimes it's our fault that women do not come under authority. I'll tell you why. It's hard for a woman to come under authority of a man that's not coming under, under the authority of Christ. You know, when he's doing this and doing that and taking this and taking that and running here and running there. It's hard for a woman to respect and come under authority of that. Because you're not coming under the authority of God. But, you know, if you're doing what the Bible tells you to do, looking after your home, looking after your wife, being an example, it should be easy for a woman to come under the authority of that. Because you're meeting every single need. And you're loving her as Christ loved the church and laid down his life. So, you know, the part of the blame is on us. We're not empty handed here. Can we say amen? Now the women's got amen, Prince and Brother. <laughs> yeah. And verse 11, we're going to go back to the text, 1 Corinthians 11. Somebody read me verse 11. <laughs> Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord. For as woman came through man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Amen. So, you know, the, we're not independent of women. We need you, women. I'm going to say it, right? I'll say it for all the brothers here. We need you. Because without my mother, I wouldn't be here. We need each other. See, it's like everybody has a part and a role to play in the family unit. Without the woman, there would be no home, there would be no children, there would be no life. Without the man, there would be maybe no provision, there would be no... What I'm saying is everybody has a job given by God. You know, it's just like the church, when you look at it, there's many parts, yet one body. There is a pastor, an evangelist, a, a teacher, a, a prophet, an apostle. All many different ministry gifts. There's a witnessing team. There's doormen. There's team women. There's a uh, crash Sunday school. There's, you know, and then there's just the general body of Christ being a testimony. We're all playing a part. 
many parts, one body. And what does the Bible say? Can the nose say to the lips, you're not important? Because where would the body be without a nose? We wouldn't be able to smell. Where, without the, the ears, can the ears say to the, the, the lips, you're a waste of time, we don't need you. Not because where would we be without a hearing? See, every part is needed. And every part is equal. Without you, we would do the job. Without you, without me, you wouldn't do the job. It's, we walk together as a team, as a family unit. Can we say amen? And right now, the government, and even just the culture itself, they're trying to destroy the family unit. They're trying to do away with the family unit. They say, we don't need a man. And we'll cut our hair short, and we'll look like a man. Well, listen, if you're going to be a man, do you have to dress like one? What's that all about? You know, it's just offensive. If you want to be the man, fine, do it. But do you have to, you know, why do they always have to dress like this? It doesn't make no sense. But you know, the, the, the thing is, it's, it's, it's that rebellious nature against the authority that God has set in place. You're not, you're not rebelling against man. You're rebelling against God. And people always have a problem with authority in general. Children have authority, problems with authority with parents. You know, we're having a, a problem with authority with government. When you look at our society in a whole, it's in chaos. Because there's no authority. Children are telling us what to do. So on TikTok, children are in cancel culture. No, he's not allowed to have because we say he said this, he said that. Do away with. We're getting run by children on TikTok. We're getting run, you know, it's, it's, there's a problem with authority. Can you say amen? Amen. Somebody agrees with me. Headship authority is practiced by God Himself. And I'm going to show you this, right? This is beautiful. If you look at Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Now remember that Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. He doesn't ask us to do something that he himself didn't do first. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 7 and read this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Wow. God the Father is on the throne. Remember, we believe in one God, who exists in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is Jesus God? Is He equal with God? Is He co-equal in power, authority, and deity? Of course He is. But yet He humbled Himself and came under authority to God the Father. See, even in the Godhead, you see submissiveness. You see somebody coming under authority of the other. And does it mean that, he's le- does that, mean that Jesus is less than God the Father? Is He some sort of lesser, you know... No, he's co-equal in power, authority and deity. But yet he still comes under authority. And the point is, women, the Bible's not saying that you are worth any less than a man. It's not. What it's saying is that you have a specific role that God has set. The Holy Spirit has a specific role. He is here and he's moving in the church and he's, he's convicting of sin and he's doing all these things because that's his role or his job, if you like. Jesus came and humbled himself and became a man and died for our sins so that we can be right with God. But that's his role, that's his job. But the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is God. God the Father is God. They are co-equal in power, authority and deity. And it doesn't mean that any is lesser than the other. And just because the woman, her role is to submit to the husband, her role is to maybe look after the children and, and look after the home, that doesn't mean that you are worth any less to God. Does it mean that? It means that this is your specific role that God has set. Now you can like that role, or you can not like that role. You can say, I don't want to be a woman, I want to be a man. That's up to you, but you have been disobedient to God. Because that's the office that He has set you in. Can we say amen? You know, I like that part of Scripture, right? Just as a side note, seven times Jesus humbles Himself. When you count it, you just count it and I'll say it, right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being the form of God, fought it not equal, fought it not Robert to be equal, but he was God. But, verse 7, he made himself of no reputation. Is that one? Somebody tell me one. 
He took upon himself the form of a servant. Count with me. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient. Obedient unto death. Even death on the cross. You see it's like an inverted V. He became low, 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 low. In the bottom rung of the bottom ladder is death on the cross. That's the creator of the universe and that's for me and you. But listen, the next part. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him. Number one. And given him a name which is above every other name. Number two. That the name of Jesus. Number three. Every knee should bow. Number four. And the things in heaven, the things in earth, and the things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Seven times Jesus humbled himself. Guess what happened? Seven times he was exalted. And you know the point is this, sisters, husbands, wives, whatever role that God has set you out to play, when you humble yourself in that position, in due time God will exalt you. When you stand before the Lord and you might think that your job is not big, looking after your children and teaching them the ways of God, teaching them how to be young men and young women of God, you know, respecting your husband and, and being there for, for your husband and helping in whichever way you can, and just being a general wife, you might think that's not, that's just a small task. In fact, it's snuffed at these days, it's looked down. Oh, she's a Stepford wife, or you know, she's this, she's that. Listen, when you stand before the Lord, you're honouring God. And think about it this way. When you look after your husband and you hold him as it should be, you're not doing it for your husband. You're doing it for God. Think about it like that. What a, what a good way to think about it. When you respect it and the role that God has given you, sometimes you can even look past the man. He might be an absolute lunatic or an idiot. Look past him. Look to God. You're doing it for God. You're not doing it for the man. And one day you will be exalted in heaven for doing what was right. Can you say amen? Is everybody still with me? Anyone want to kill me yet? Yeah. Yeah, back to 1 Corinthians, back to the text. Just got a couple of scriptures there. Look, so Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does also. So he came under authority. So when Jesus says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am He. And I do nothing on my own, but say only what the Father taught me. See, He, he humbled Himself, He became obedient. This is just the back of what we're saying about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was fully God, fully man, hyperstatic union. He wasn't... A part of God or lesser version of God. He is God. Most assuredly I say to you. Before Abraham was. I am. This is when they, this is when they went to stone him. Because they, they were saying. Are you better than Abraham ever found And he looked at them right in the eye. And he said listen. Before Abraham was. I am. That means I am God. They were like. Oh I'm fighting the stone. We're going to kill him. Because he said he was God. See he's equal with God. He is God. John 10, 30. I and my Father are one. It's not three gods. It is one God who exists in three persons. Co-equal in power, authority and deity. I know that's hard for our minds to understand. We'll probably never comprehend it until we go to be with the Lord. But that's the God that we serve. He exists in three persons. Yet he come under authority. It didn't make him any less. He was God. He was co-equal. But yet he became humble. Can we, say, can we say amen? Even to the point of death at the cross. So we're going to read back in the text, 1 Corinthians 11, 5 to 10. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For that is even as if she should be shaven. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shaven. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shaven, let her be covered. So what Paul's saying is, you know, you can, you can beat around the bush, but what he's saying is this. If you are not going to wear a veil over your head, then you might as well just go and shave your head altogether. You know, it's, 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 it's like that sort of theme. He's not saying this is what should be done. 
But what he's saying is, it's like nobody's going to shave their head. Women, we don't expect you to shave your head. Neither does Paul. The point is, if you're, if you're going to not wear a veil and, and be like a man, then shave your head off. Be like a man completely. You know, that's the, who's going to do that? But he said, if it's a shame for that to happen, then cover your head. You get the point. What he's saying is, nobody's going to shave their head. So let's be respectful and let's, let's veil it. Because that's what God intended it to be. Can we say amen? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the image and the glory of man. We've been through that. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. We've been through that. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman created for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have a covering on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither is the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man is also of the woman. So we need the woman. Been through that. Then Paul said in verse 13, judging yourself, is it commonly that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now some people say, aha, that means that our hair is a covering so we don't have to wear a scarf. Got you. Well, no, because that does away with what Paul just says. If you're not wearing a scarf, you might as well shave your hair. It doesn't make sense. See, what Paul's saying is, doesn't even, it's, look, think about it. Judge for yourself. And I'm going to put it in other terms. Think about it, guys. If God has given you, if nature itself has given women long hair for covering, how much more should we veil our head? You know, I was going to use the boys of Aston as an illustration, Sandy and maybe William. You know, the boys have got short hair, some's got no hair. There's a good few of us in here with bald heads. Is there any women with bald heads? No. Because nature, you know, the way our bodies work and chemicals or whatever else, it's, you know, some of us has, has more male gene than others, and it causes our head to be bald. So it's actually a compliment, guys. It means that you're more manly than the rest of us, some of us. But, you know, the point is, Paul said is this, right? Nature itself shows you that men have short hair, women have long hair, so it's designed that way from the Lord to, to set out, to set apart. And yes, some men have long hair. Yes, that's you know sometimes the case. And even in the Bible, some men have long hair as uh, they took a Nazarite vow. They took a vow to the Lord, and that was the, the vow that they took. That some of them had long hair, but it was a rarity. And the majority, the majority scale through every custom and every culture, men have short hair, women has long hair. You look around, I don't see one man with long hair in this place. Why is that? Because it's an embarrassment to have long hair. Some men have long hair, ponytails, and whatever else. And that's up to them. It, you know, but it's, it's a very rare thing, isn't it? Can we say amen? So when we look at that scripture, it's not saying that, that the women can just have their hair as a veil. No, Paul said, if you're going to do that, shave your head altogether. But he said, you know, how much more, if God intended it to be that way, how much more should we comply with what God wants? Can we say amen? <laughs> Everybody still with me? So that we're going to go through a couple of arguments, right? The biggest argument you find in all your commentaries today, and all your, if you read some commentaries or men preaching about this, say, it's a cultural thing. It was just the cultural back then. But I'm going to knock that down with a big sledgehammer, right? Because when you look at the, 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 the culture, they're saying it, it was because what they did in them days. Now, I've got to explain something. There's principles in the Bible and there's culture. And we can't confuse the two. Culture is a custom, is different, right? Custom. So what that'll be is, I, I, I explained it to some of the brothers earlier on. Tithing is a biblical principle, is that correct? We're told to do it by God. We're told to tithe and whatever else, right? But they tithed in shekels and denarii back then. That was their custom. Does that mean that we have to go and transfer money into shekels and denarii and tithe in, 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 in that sense? No, obviously that makes no sense. But see, some things are clearly obviously custom. And some things are principles set up by God. Tithing is a principle. You can't knock it out of the Bible. And the, the problem is when you take a principle and you say that it's just a custom, you know, you can be completely 
way off the mark. You have to have biblical evidence to say that. If you're going to take something that God has ordained and set up and say, I believe that's just a custom, then you have to back it up by scripture, my friend, because you're going to stand before God. And the burden lies on you, not on us. Because if I'm wearing a headscarf and I'm wrong, then, you know, all I'm doing is being too stringent. There's no big deal. But if I'm not wearing a headscarf and it's designed by God and set up by God, then you have a problem. You're in sin. You're being disobedient. You see the problem? It's a different, there's the difference between principles and culture. Principles are things that are given by God for all time. Principles are given by God for all time, for all generations, regardless of the culture or the custom. It transcends, it means it's bigger than all of that. It goes beyond all of that. And you know, we have a, a culture predominantly tribal and gypsy. I know there's, there's, there's some that's not, but the, you know, but there's cultural differences. But you remember, I preached about it last time. Our culture is here, and God's word is here, and it's the same. It, it, it transcends. It's bigger than tribal and gypsy people, Gaza people. It's different than, than Asian people and, and African people, and all these different maybe races. The Bible transcends all of this. Can we say amen? You know, Paul says, whatever is done in doubt is sin, in Romans 14, 23. And he's talking about eating food, same types of foods and all that, right? And what it means is simply this. If you don't know and it's a grey area, if it's not too clear to you, then you better err on the side of caution and do it. Because it's sin. You know, if you're thinking, well, I don't know if that really has to, I don't know, it's maybe a great, no, listen. Well, you better err on the side of caution and, and just follow what the Bible says. Rather than saying, well, no, I'm going to just chance it. But, you know, that's wrong. Because, you know, you could be in the wrong. And I'm going to show you that definitely, through Scripture, headscarves is still for today and it's still for our culture. Right, so reasons for it being principle and not custom. Reason number one. Reason number one. And it's, this one very simple. When you read in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, in, in verse 2, it says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So Paul is bringing these things to these people. So therefore, it's not really their custom or their culture if Paul is giving it to them. The same way as I'm giving it to you this morning. You know, it's not... Saying headscarves is not really our custom or our culture. But because it's in the Bible, we do it. Because it's given from God. And Paul has given these people that teaching from God. And that alone should tell you that these people, it wasn't really their custom or culture. If Paul has given it to them. Can we say amen? Paul states why. And I'm going to finish. I'm landing the plane now. So don't worry about it. It's not going to be much longer. Because maybe I've got questions on this one. But Paul states why. You know, he says, women, wear a headscarf for X, Y, and Z. So we can't read into that and say, well, look, I think, because if you read most commentaries that say, it was ladies of the night that didn't wear headscarves. And it was inappropriate. So Paul told them to wear headscarves. It was their culture, and that day it doesn't apply to us. You have a problem. Because you're reading into the text, and you're also ignoring that Paul has given his own reason. It's got, you've just blanked it. You know, you're saying, I don't care what Paul says the reason why. I'm going to make up the reason why so that we cannot do it today. But the problem you have is that Paul says why. And the reason that he gives is back to creation. <laughs> and then you have a bigger problem because when it goes back to creation, that again, it transcends time, culture, minority, majority, whatever you want to do. When you go back to Adam and Eve, that is a principle. It is no longer a custom. Do you get what I'm saying? Paul took it right back to Adam and Eve. He never said, well, look, because of the, the ladies of the night that don't wear scarves, uh, we should wear scarves as a sign of authority. Paul doesn't say that. That's put in by commentaries. But Paul says it goes back to creation and it's a sign of authority. God has made us that way. Can we say amen? You know, when you think about that, because it was set up at creation, 
You can't say it was a cultural thing or a custom thing. It doesn't work. Your argument is made of straw. You know, even when you look at Jewish men, the wool was called the yarmulke. I, I wore one when I was in Israel up at the wall. Because you have to wear a yarmulke to go to the wall. They wore a head covering. It's not in the Torah, you won't find it in the Old Testament. It's nowhere to be found. They've just done it because it was a tradition. But Paul speaks against that. He says a man ought not to cover his head. So you can't say it was their custom because it was their custom for the men to wear a head covering. Yet Paul was coming against it. He's got what I'm saying. Verse 16, now listen, Paul is getting some heat for this. And in verse 16, this is when you know it's going against the culture, the custom of the day. He says, but if any man seems to be contentious regarding this custom, it, regarding this, we have no such custom, neither do the churches of God. So what Paul said is, he, he washed his hands, and listen, women, men, I'm done. I've explained myself and I'm leaving it at that. And there's no such custom anywhere in any church of God. The problem that we have today is there is such customs in other churches. There is churches that are teaching it's okay. It's not for today, it's not the culture. But if they took it by the Bible and by what Paul says, they should all stand on the, the, the concrete mark and say, listen, this is a principle that God has set up. It transcends time, culture and custom. And if God asks us to do it, then we do it. It's simple. But yet churches are trying to wangle the way out. And the problem is, listen, once they, once they let this go, then women preachers, women teachers, women pastors, do you see the problem? You look at the American churches now, it's constant. All the women are preaching, women are teaching, they're saying authority about command. Why? Because it's just custom. It's not a principle from God. But they can't say that. It is, they're an error. And that, I've just shown you from the Bible. And you want one last thing and let it close. Done. This one's a cracker. You can't, you can't get away from it. He says, and it's because of the angels. Now, you know the angels are present. We just went through it in the study. We were right through it. The angels are here. And out of everything you've just heard, now Paul says, and because of the angels. And now you know what it means. It means that they are present. And they're, they're expecting you to come under the authority of God, your husband, the, 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 the way that God has set it up. You know, an angel doesn't have a custom. It doesn't have a time. The... the before we were created, the timeless. So, for, if it was just to forget everything I said, and all of the reasons, even if it was just for the angels, we should do it because it transcends time, culture, and, and custom. Does that make any sense? I've made it good enough. I feel like I can just, you know, drop the mic now, and that's it. I don't, I don't know, you know, if there's any other argument that can be made against it. But you know, the problem is. I'll tell you what the problem is. It doesn't lie with wearing a headscarf. It doesn't lie with, you know, a scarf is just a sign. But the problem is the authority. Like a, like a text. It's not really a problem with the authority of your husband. But it's in, in our, our custom, our society in general hates authority. You know, for you to say a woman should come under a man. Ah, oh, get him off. Try to come out by the by his Stone. Try to in the car. <laughs> you know, they hate it. Some women would absolutely hate what I'm saying right now. And then even for men to be under the, the authority of, of Jesus. Ah, oh, I'm sick of hearing this. I'm sick of hearing that. God's not real. We don't want it. And then even children to go under the authority of the parents. They don't want to. Because we're rebellious at heart. But you know, when we come under Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So, if you can listen, I'm not forcing anybody to do anything. I can only teach what the Bible says. And you do what you want. That Romans that scripture that says that, you know, if there's doubt and you're still doing it, then it's sin. I think I've, in a court of law, I think I've argued the point enough to say that there's sufficient evidence that it is a principle and not a custom. But you do with that what you want, how you want. Any questions before we pray? Somebody give me something. Charlie, you can turn that record off now, you Let's pray then, we'll have a time. Just think about any questions you might want to ask. Thank you, Jalob, just thank you for your word, my God.